guy from Germany who stubbornly just wanted to play music. Hans Zimmer is a, a crazy genius. He's just one of the nicest people I've ever met and a great film composer. Never thought about a career, never written a note of music for money. There, I don't think there are few words to define Hans the way I know him. Uh, Hans is a genius. Somebody who's concerned with making sure that we will have orchestras forever and try to support my musician friends and try to discover new people and never growing up. A lot of the producers go, oh my God, no Hans, can you not write the thing that you did so that you, got an, you get an Oscar and this and that? And he said, no, I'm going to do it all differently and everybody is scared and in the end it's a hit and in the end everybody copies Hans's music. He's this guy that I met 30, seven years ago that's, that's come up, that's written some unbelievable music and had an, an incredible career. I play music, that's what I do. Hans first mentioned to me, I think, about eight years ago, that he would really like to do some concerts of his music. And I said, well, I'd be very happy to be involved. And then I didn't hear anything. So I thought, well, he's too busy or gone off the idea. But earlier this year, he said, look, I've decided again to take time off writing. I really want to do some concerts. Can you be involved? And I said, yeah, happy, very happy to be involved. I start the show off with um, my friends Richard Harvey and Nick Lenny Smith. My life in music really started with them. 30 years ago, um, they had this wonderful studio called the Snake Ranch, which was a great name. And I could go and make noise in the middle of the night. And sometimes during the day, we would all go and play together. And I learned more from both Richard and Nick than I learned from anybody else. And I've known Ants for a long time and we've done so many projects together and we're just very good friends who enjoy working together and there's a lot of respect going both ways I think which is really nice. I first met Hans I think I was working as a recording engineer at a place called Riverside Recordings in London and he came in very briefly um, long haired leather jacket and he was like the synthesizer boy in town but he wasn't really I, I was like a piano player Hammond player and synth player he had this little box called a Roland Microcomposer and he would just program up on this little 10 keypad and then press record and get a sound on his profit and suddenly magic would happen. I've known Hans for 35 years. When I first met Hans, we were both very thin and had a lot of hair. You know, times have changed, but we had two uh, common factors, if you like. We were both with Aerodel Agency which were mainly doing TV advertisement music at that time. But also we were both friendly with Stanley Myers, the composer. We both worked with Stanley, we both uh, co-wrote. In those days, we didn't have computers. If you wanted to get a job, you did a great demo. And Hans would do great demos with his Prophet 5 and his modular Moog and his modular Roland. I got my jobs by playing flute, clarinet, piano, acoustic guitar. So I'd do tracks all by myself and he'd do tracks all by himself, but we'd help each other out sometimes. So we worked together quite a bit. There's a spirit of more than friendship, is brotherhood and music and brotherhood personally. I think from the first time we worked together, a unwritten formula happened, just inspired by the music and the spirit of how we work together. He has selected some of his dearest friends and some of his closest musical collaborators arranged his music for orchestra with drums, with choir, with band and soloists and um, combined that with a spectacular light show and a very, very personal and private storytelling session 
uh, from him. I think it's a brilliant idea, actually, um, uh, because people are going to get to know him the way we know him, who, who have worked with him for so many years, as an intimate, funny, intelligent, brilliant man, and not just as an untouchable god of, of uh, film music. Next to that one, which needs to close it, right? Yeah. Morning, how are you? This is Guthrie. Yeah, how are you, Guthrie? Nice to meet you. How's it going? Uh, if I don't hit that, you'd get a lot. It seems a little bit better. We've been rehearsing here for, I guess, two weeks as a band, and then we put the orchestra in. We had four rehearsals with them, two rehearsals with the choir, about three rehearsals with the girl drum line. Oh, hang on a second. Something's going in right now. I've arrived this morning with. 25 instruments. My taxi driver said, have you got all the instruments for the orchestra? And I said, no, I'm playing them all myself. He said, oh, really? That's unusual. I said, I know, that's, that's how I get hired. I'm good value for money. Thank you. It's much less tiring um, rehearsing uh, for these shows than, re than actually working on films because when you're working on films, you know, you're stuck in the studio for, you know, 12 hours a day, seven days a week for about four or five months, depending on the project, you know, and this is, you know, we get to be with our friends, we get to be out, and we get to be here in London, which is great, out in the city, and, you know, we're able to actually play our instruments and not just be sitting there trying to write cues and stuff, so it's actually, it's much more fun and it's much more enjoyable, definitely. If you sound bad, you might want to talk to him. Okay. Why do I sound so bad? <laughs> <laughs> Practice, right, okay. You know, part of what I wanted to do is, in a, in a funny way, I wanted to show not the not the composer sitting at the grand piano, you know, not the not the conductor. I asked the orchestra, do you want a conductor? And, and they said, you know, secretly, honestly, we play better without one. You know, we know what we're doing. Um, I wanted to show this camaraderie of musicians. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite good to start with. In that case, I'm always doing for. What's the? Where, where do I not have to move? Yes, of course. Right. Yeah, hold one chord position and just hit string. Is it? I'm really enjoying the format of this because I would have expected when, when Hans said he was going to do a major show of, of like a re retrospective of his work, I thought it was going to be a big orchestra and a few other things. This is more like a band. It's getting quite loud in there. A lot of guitars, bass, a lot of drums, a lot of keyboards, and uh, it feels like a band. We are very prepared. I mean, everything everything was written out. And, the, you know, the band learned it, and we always had it. Like, we had a pre-record of the orchestra while we were uh, rehearsing. So as people come in, you know, we take out pre-records. Well, it's the same as when you go and do a recording session with the orchestra. Everything's already on Pro Tools, so you're replacing elements. So we're working out how to do the parts that we're replacing. And then, obviously, we're listening to the orchestra of Pro Tools because they're not here. Oh, oh hang on. It's, it's um, 50. It is bar 50. Can we just, just for us, can we just play from bar 48? So we're just getting ourselves together so we can hear the orchestra, we can listen to the sounds we're supposed to be replicating, and get our acts together. And then we put the orchestra and the choir together on the 8th and the 10th. 
and then we do the shows. Then we go home. <laughs> And it was the only way to do it, because if we had had, I don't know, 72 people in the room on the first day, I would have died. <laughs> you know, there's no way I could have controlled it. And like this, it was just slowly building up a sound, really, because even though we are faithful to the music, we are interpreting it in a new way. I loved Crimson Tide. Um, again, I was quite involved with that with Hans, and as he says in the concerts, there was a big thing about whether Jerry Bruckheimer and Don Simpson, the producers, would let Hans use a choir, because they didn't think that was the right way to go. But Tony Scott backed him up, and Bob Badamy eventually kicked them all out and said, just let Hans get on writing some music. And I think he wrote some very beautiful music for that. And I think it's one of the, you know, one of the nicest pieces we play in the show. It's very good. Mind you, they're all nice. <laughs> I mean, we got a lot of people on the stage. Alexei Gutzmann and Tristan Schulze. I mean, uh, the first time I, you know, I met Alexei and Tristan, they had a, a string trio called Triology, and Ennio Morricone introduced me to them, and he literally said to me, these are the only people that can play my music. You know, and I thought that was a pretty good recommendation. So Hans Zimmer was there, and he was thinking, okay, I want those guys as well. I want them to play my music. So he invited us to work with him on some movies. The first uh, movie we did together was El Dorado, and then Spanglish as well, and then some years later he called me, myself, to work on the Sherlock Holmes movies, which was a lot of fun. Uh, we really created an, a, a very special sound and sound world, uh, a crazy sound world for that. Yolanda Charles and Mary Scully, you know, the, the electric bass and the acoustic bass. I mean, Mary has played on everyone pretty much every one of my scores I've recorded in England. I met Yolanda through Dave Stewart. Um, she, you know, I mean, she's, she's a phenomenal musician. And then, of course, there's Sutnam. You know, whatever happened to Angels and Demons is an uh, entirely Sutnam story. He picked himself six rather amazing percussionists who happened to all be beautiful. Just like what we did at the I met Hans at a dinner party and we jammed. It was a bizarre jam, actually. He was playing La Vie en Rose on piano. My friend was singing. Stuart Copeland from The Police was playing bongos. And I was playing drums and none of us knew the song. And sure enough, Hans trusted me to work with him on Sherlock Holmes, and that was the beginning of our, our collaboration together. Gasfrey Govan, I, I saw him on YouTube, and if Richard and Nick are the beginning of my musical life in a way. I wanted to have somebody I'd never worked with before. So I phoned him up and I sort of made him the leap to the future. A lot of the pieces, there were no guitars on the score, but Guthrie found a way to put some magic into it. Yeah, great. I can't do both because they happen at the same time, I think. In oh, then let's give that one to Frank. Yeah. 
That's a really good thank part. You know, it was really more like exploring, you know, where people, you know, we, we knew what the orchestra would do. We know what they do. But, we, you know, I wanted to see what room I could leave for Richard or what room I could, you know, leave for Yolanda. I mean, you know, Sherlock has never been performed with slap bass, you know, but it's it sort of works. I just thought, what am I going to do in Man of Steel? What am I going to do in, in Dark Knight? Because at the beginning, Hans said to me, look, play what you like. Just use all the rehearsal time to listen, to, to look, and whatever you feel like playing, just do it. It'll be fine. It just gives it an extra dimension, which I think is exciting for the audience. Certainly exciting for us to play with. Let's have a break. All of the musicians actually that you see on stage, or I'd say all of the core band are people that Hans actually has real relationships with. This on stage band is not just randomly hired professionals that came out to play music that they don't care about. The entire band is actually family and Hans has been very loyal to his family and we all love him and love his music and I think it's going to show in the concert. It's like a big extended family and there's people that I haven't known that long like um, you know Alexi and Anne-Marie and I haven't seen them around very much but when you do see them it's like oh you know how are you what are you up to so it is it's like a big family it is, it is good and it's great working with people at, at that level they you know they're all really good and they they make you realize that you, you kind of have to raise your game a bit, you know? There's some really good people around you and they're all watching you, so you can't... <laughs> no, not that I would, you know, not that I wouldn't give it all, but you know, but it, but it is, it, it's, everybody's vibing each other up, everybody's pushing each other. It's like picked a national football team and he's got all his, all his best players. And that was great, because, you know, we, we didn't have that much time to prepare for this, so. He's obviously very happy. He's got everyone he wanted. It's a great band, though. Really great. Let's use a observation. Well, I have to say that. <laughs> My function on this project is to provide the material that the musicians are going to be playing from in coordination with the copying team and orchestrator team out in Los Angeles. Bruce Viola and his team in Los Angeles have done all the orchestrations for Hans for many, many years. They did all the charts, so we have orchestra parts and also we have band parts. And we just, you know, a lot of us know the pieces because we've been working on them. We decide what we're going to play and work that way. And then once we've got the basic structure and the rhythm, then it's time to put the orchestra on to give the colour and the body and the texture that only an orchestra can do. This sort of project is definitely a work in progress because it's a very creative project and so things are changing every minute and so I get requests to add certain passages to other parts and just mix and match it a little bit to make it how they want it and then I reprint it and take it down for them to incorporate into the performance. Yesterday we worked on Lion King and I'm playing exactly the same lines on that score that I played, what, 18 years ago, 20 years ago, 20 years maybe, yeah. And Hans keeps looking round and saying, ah, oh, that sounds exactly like it did 20 years ago.
Hans called me. He was in LA, I was in London. He said, can you get on a plane? Can you come over? We need a lot of instruments for the Lion King score. Well, actually, I didn't know about the Lion King. He said, I've got this new movie. It's for Disney, it's an animation. I said, look, first of all, I, I can't make it over there. He said, the best thing is you send me the music, you send me the recordings, and I have all my instruments at home, and we'll just DHL everything back and forth. <clears throat> Even then, this was the days before being able to email large files. So I did all the recording in my studio in London and sent him tapes over to LA. So we never actually saw each other during that project. It was an interesting time. Nobody at Disney really knew whether it was going to be a success or not. They were all very worried. Oh, we can't afford a third trumpet, you know. But uh, it seems to have done quite well for everybody. Zah, she is extraordinary. Her voice is just mind-blowing. And, and I just knew her as a, you know, composer and somebody who worked, at, uh, you know, with hands and other people as well. It's just so nice to be on stage with them for once. Uh, and the other musicians are just brilliant. Of course, I, I do have a wonderful, special connection with Anne-Marie. I've worked with her on, on many different movies together with Hans. And I think we do have a really good chemistry on, on stage. It's amazing to me that a lot of people think that film scores are something that are written once and then are presentable as a live concert. But actually, this is an entirely new platform for Hans's music where it can really stand alone. Do you have that? And it's been amazing to see the, the parts come to life with a live band. And it'll be even more amazing when the entire orchestra, choir, and drumline are also revealed at the performance. a lot of music to choose from and uh, they'd spend a long time deciding which bits they wanted to use and it's really down to Hans at the end of the day but I think he had a lot of friends and um, colleagues giving their opinions and, and Gladiator they just had the love theme and you know this is one thing where I did make a difference I said you've got to have some of the battle from Gladiator and I said well we tried it but it's never worked. Th this, this one was a big bone of contention getting this one together I mean Zahn, I did a version which nobody liked, then Steve and An oh, Andrew was beating up on me going, they, there's the one tune I wanted to leave out, he's going, they played an ice hockey game. So we went took pieces, put it all together now, so we have a, a much more rounded, it's a much more complete arc of the story for Gladiator. And then some of the medleys have been put together, so you know, there are movies, rather than just having a two minute or three minute piece, we've made some longer selections which have two or three different movies in the same piece of music which are joined together, which makes it interesting as well. So, so let's just have a listen from the beginning. I think that's probably the best thing. Somebody's head exploded halfway through. Sorry. 
It was the it was the Hammond that just made me feel so heavenly. I, I lost the chords. Oh, okay. 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 Some of these pieces are 20 minutes, I think Batman is probably 20 minutes long. So I think it's probably, uh, I don't know, I haven't timed it. I haven't timed it, but it must be 50 minutes or something. It's quite, quite a lot. More than I thought it would take me to remember. <laughs> Sorry. It's, the thing I love about this concert is the body of work over 30 years, from Driving Miss Daisy through to, I guess the latest one out is Spider-Man. There's a huge variety and different mood, but always good tunes, great ideas, you know. Each one's unique and individual, but they work really well together as a concert as well. Right now, all I know is, in a funny way, the, the only thing my life is about is these pieces of music, because I'm just trying to memorize them. I'm just trying to be in this moment. I don't have any other pieces of music in my head. Ah, okay, take the okay. fake ones out. When I was preparing for this project, I was going back through old files and looking at, um, you know, because I'm, I'm playing um, a lot of textures and soundscapes and things that I created for the various movies and flying them in live in different places and so forth. And so actually looking at the dates on them, you know, looking at the original Batman files, they're 2004, they're 10 years old. And it's, wow, it's a long, long time. <laughs> my first time in public with an accordion and I've managed to get a parrot to sit on the side of it so it's, uh, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun actually it works well in parrots and I also play it in um, Sherlock and Madagascar and then uh, put it down for the rest of the show Do you think, do you think this is like the yeah. Frank Ricotti on Marimbas and Gary Cattell on Timpani. They're generally known in this town as the Dangerous Brothers. And if you look at the history of their film work, or if you just look at the history of the work they did, it's it's absolutely amazing. And one of sort of my greatest games of recording in London is always because they've played on everything and they've done everything, you know. I always try to think of one thing one like new thing that they haven't done you know it's usually you know i'm going well if you were to hit the temps with brushes on the side just like this and they go i don't know hans i don't know if this will sound good and then they go out there and they go wow this is really good we've never done this before and then i'm happy i'm trying to keep the excitement going <laughs> oh, I, I, there's a really bad idea me doing this <laughs> When we were listening through to stuff in Los Angeles, we started playing True Romance and I suddenly remembered Tony Scott coming in the room, 
when we were working on that and thinking he's no longer with us. That I thought he's looking down, listening. So yeah, there's, there's some emotion attached, but mostly it's just working out what we're going to do and getting everything to sound as good as it can do. It's key that this concert is visually interesting, you know, and it's, you know, you may have the best drummer or bass player or guitarist, but they'll sit there with the same instrument in their hand all night. My job is to pick up a different instrument every two minutes. People go, oh, what is that? What's he playing now? Wow, what's that sound? Oh, it's coming from him. So I'm a bit of a kind of joker in the pack. I always coming up with surprises. So I a bit like a magic show, I had to prepare everything I was doing. You know the other member in the band really is Mark Brickman our lighting designer. I've known Mark for many, many years. He's always been the great visionary lighting designer for Pink Floyd. And so I said to him, I don't want to tell you what to do. You know my music really well. You just do what you want to do. You just go and jam on this music. He took the whole building down today, the power in the whole building, which is very normal with Mark, you know? Things will either explode or whatever, you know, and you just have to be prepared for this. Harvey said to me, you better be prepared to tell the audience what would be up on these lights and what would be there because we might not have power, but you know, it's Mark. And you know, it works as a concert without showing one frame of picture. You know, it's all music from the movies, but there are no movie clips being shown, which I think it makes it quite extraordinary. I don't often listen to soundtracks without the film, and I really do prefer to, to, to listen to the music within the film, which is where it was intended to, to be. But to hear it in a concert environment like, like, like this, and it's been really well crafted, it's been really well thought about. You know, the segues to one into the other and, and the medleys where you're going from theme to theme to theme. It really works well. I, mean, I think people are really going to appreciate the effort that's gone into it. I just think there has to be one idiot in the, in the show, at least one, one person who is the madman. And, and that's just my role. I, I like that role because, uh, because I do. It just fits me. Uh, no, I, I love to have fun on stage. I love to, you know, I, I don't make fun of music. I make fun with music, with the help of music. And uh, those little props or maybe a mask here or there just may give a little smile to the audience as well because some of that music is very heavy, very intense, and it may just need that little... It's like having a dessert and just adding a little bit of red pepper. People always mistake the idea that a composer is a performer. I am not a performer. You know, I, I get stage fright. You know, that's why I haven't done many shows. Um, but it's Anne-Marie and Alexei Gutsman, really, who are guilty of making me play the banjo. You know, Anne-Marie in her sweet little way going, you know, Hans, I think it would be really fun if... I'm going, no. And, you know, of course I end up playing the banjo. There's, there's actually nothing like this out there in the world. Because it's like a modern music, but it's almost like a rock concert as well, because we've got such elements of percussion and you know all Hans' stuff in there. But also it's just such a great production from the lights. And just got 70 odd people on stage. It's a big spectacle. And all great music. 
he's such a master at what he does. I always learn something from the process of working with him. It doesn't matter which project it is. And um, we always have a good time. You know, I have three rules. If I'm conducting an orchestra or writing music, it doesn't matter. We've got to do great work. We've got to make magic. But we've also got to have fun. We'll see, you know, let's say, let's get through tonight alive. We can discuss if we're going to do something else. There are some people you know for so long that even if you don't see them for two years, it's just like there's been no separation. Hans is one of these guys who really values people who, who he's known a long time, with, you know, with no breaks, no upsets. I just say about Hans and myself, you know, we really understand each other well and we go back a very long way. And I don't think anything will ever get in the way of that. You know, we're not rivals in any way. We're not, you know, we don't interfere with what we complement. All the activities we do musically, it complements each other. So we're, we've always been friends and we'll always be friends. It's just that I'm in Europe, he's in the States. But, you know, I'm so happy that I was one of the first people that he put on the list. Anyway, I hear they're playing uh, the first song now, so I better go, otherwise I'll be in trouble. Cheers, guys. Somebody said to me recently, um, you know, when you don't feel the nerves, you have to go and do something else. I feel the nerves, trust me. My stuff is on my lap. Look. No, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, look, I'm it. not. I'm not. I'm not in charge of that. Are one. you? No, I'm <laughs> not. <laughs> not it's all right. I don't mind. It's okay. I'll plan the whole fucking house now. <laughs> you know. I mean, I just write the stuff. I think they're trying out the stuff with us. Right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Don't use any of it. Let us do it. The German version. Okay. So try to try to. Try to get the German, Tristan and I. I mean, you know, it's like Tristan, Tristan. Tristan. So it's Deshi Basara. You can do the Ra. Right, okay. Mr. Harvey, that's really ridiculous. They asked me to do it. Okay. The subwoofers are definitely working. I can feel them. <laughs> 